Thank you very much, Mrs. Lejava. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm very honored to speak in front of, of so many people. I'm very honored that you all have come. Uh, when I speak about German political positions, I can speak here fully, officially, as the German ambassador. When I give you interpretations of, of history, uh, this is my own interpretation, this is personal. So please make this difference, and not everything I say is an official position. That would be a very boring speech. Also, I'm, uh, I'm still quite new in Georgia. I arrived half a year ago, uh, so I am not the expert here. And you have had the, you have had the series of, of talks already. I think you have immersed yourself deeply into these questions, and you will know uh, more about them than, than I do. So I'm very interested in, in hearing your views and entering in the, in the discussion. I'm not the ex absolute expert here. German policy is embedded in the policy of, of the EU. We uh, conduct this policy as part of the European team, and the EU as a whole is guided by OSCE principles. Principles of the Conference of Helsinki of 1975, and reconfirmed so many times, which are actually also fundamental parts of international law in general. And a very central one, you could say the most fundamental principle of uh, the OCE is territorial integrity. Each state has this right to territorial integrity. This is absolutely fundamental for all questions we are dealing with in Europe. And therefore, we unambiguously support Georgia's territorial integrity. This right uh, to, to have a territory and intact state borders and no one can violate them, violate them uh, accrued to Georgia at the time when the Soviet Union collapsed. And this right passed to the constituent republics of uh, the Soviet Union. It did not pass to autonomous uh, regions and various entities that existed in, in the Soviet Union. This is a very clear thing and an important principle, which is important not only for Georgia, but for the entire post-Soviet space, because there are a couple of such uh, situations. With regard to the torn away regions of Georgia, the EU pursues a policy of non-recognition and engagement, or otherwise engagement without recognition. Uh, the non-recognition means there is no such thing as a, a state of Abkhazia or a state of South Ossetia, when I worked in Moscow at the German embassy, uh, I was careful at some events looking out. Could there be somebody coming to me, uh, engaging me in a discussion, and then giving me his, his business card as, I don't know, the ambassador of Abkhazia to, to Moscow, and I would have had to give him the card back or react in some way, but nothing like that ever happened. They never made an attempt. Uh, so as diplomats, we are especially careful about making this non-recognition clear. The engagement part means uh, that uh, we think it is important to maintain human contacts with the people living in these regions, in Abkhazia and South Ossetia, on the other side of uh, the so-called administrative boundary line on non-government-controlled territory. Why is it important to maintain contacts with the people? First, of course, for humanitarian reasons. We can put ourselves in, in the skin of uh, people living in regions that are more or less cut off from the world. You have uh, people living here in Tbilisi also as uh, have come from there as, as refugees, so uh, maybe there are even people here who have made the experience. Um, for humanitarian reasons, contacts should be maintained, but also with a view to finally addressing and resolving the conflict. Even if it takes a very long time, uh, the important thing is that the people on both sides of these boundary lines uh, should remain in contact to maintain the basic capability of talking to each other and at some point living together in, uh, in one political entity. Here in Tbilisi, we are often asked, I'm often asked by, by journalists, why the EU and NATO, Germany, don't speak about occupation in their official papers and their resolutions on this present situation. 
and uh, maybe you know the episode when Chancellor Merkel was here in Tbilisi in, in, uh, in August. She was asked very explicitly by, by students, uh, I think repeatedly, I was not there, uh, is this not occupation? Why don't you call it occupation? And she said, well, yes, if you ask me so directly, it is occupation. Um, and this was uh, good for me as an ambassador because I can point to her example and said, yes, the Chancellor said it, yes, of course. We do consider the presence of uh, Russian troops on Georgian territory illegal and illegitimate. We are very clear about that. Uh, what we want to point out, however, is that one word, occupation, does not capture the entirety of, of these conflicts. It is much too, too simple to say, we need to call things by their right name, so occupation is the right name, and there we have it captured. The conflict is uh, complex and consists on three levels, I would say. One, indeed, is the bilateral level between Georgia and Russia. Russia has troops on Georgian territory, it's occupying, uh, and this is a very one-sided conflict. There is nothing that Georgia is doing to, to Russia. In fact, Georgia maintains very pragmatic relations with Russia. So this is the bilateral level. Another Older level, I would say, is the communal conflict that exists between uh, communities in Abkhazia, uh, between ethnic communities in Abkhazia and South Ossetia, uh, which has resulted in, in uh, deep conflict at the time when the Soviet Union fell apart. Uh, at this time, uh, the build-up of the new Georgian state uh, was an important thing, of course, but it was mishandled in important aspects and uh, the, the rights and, and the identity of uh, people of non-Georgian origin living in Georgia were not considered at a, at a sufficient level to make them feel at home in this new independent state. Um, and to make matters worse, uh, when uh, the situation worsened, at a certain point Georgia reacted by sending troops into Abkhazia, which of course led to uh, the war that we know, the first war of 1991-92, which uh, claimed many lives and many people lost their homes. This is conflict, you may say, which is long ago. To me, 30 years is not so long. Uh, many people can still remember this well. And the conflict is not over because there's no more shooting and because there's no more People are not driven from their homes anymore. Um, it is, an, in my view, an unresolved, uh, simmering conflict that has to be addressed if you want to deal with the situation. Finally, third level is the international level or geopolitical level, as people like to say. The conflict either between Russia and the, the West, you could call it that, or uh, the attempt of Russia to, to rebuild, to regain a sphere of influence in, in Eastern Europe. In this case, Georgia has more of an instrumental role for Russia. Russia is using various situations in various countries to, as they say in Moscow, and I've heard it many times there, to strike back at the West. Some people in Moscow talk about it very lightly, they say, the West has scored so many goals against us. It's like a football match. You have enlarged NATO and the EU, and so many countries have entered the EU and NATO, and are coming closer and closer to our borders. <sighs> Finally, we have to do something too. Of course, uh, occupying Georgian territory <laughs> is, not, uh, is not a way of putting uh, a signal to, to the United States, but this is how Russians see it. Uh, there's a sphere of influence of the West, Georgia belongs to it, so if we strike there, we have created a little bit more balance, we have become a little bit more even. These, these are the, the three levels of the conflict we, we should take into account. Um, what about specific German situations. If I turn to, to Germany, well, uh, what, what is 
special for us vis-à-vis uh, -vis other partners in, in the EU, for instance. Maybe for, for Germans, uh, the peaceful order in Europe is, is even more precious or it's more present in our minds than for some of our neighbors. Um, we have had the experience of living in a divided country. Uh, there was violence in Germany. The border inside Germany looked um, much more, or was much more dangerous and deadly than even the boundary lines you see in Georgia. People were being killed there. Um, the estimates vary and in many cases are unknown, but at least 250 people were, were killed at the inner German border and the Berlin Wall, which you know. Um, so uh, to us, and this I remember well, the years of 1989 when the Berlin Wall fell 30 years ago, uh, of 1990 when Germany was reunified and the OCE conference was held in Paris and all of a sudden all countries in Europe had complete agreement on what rules should be valid on this entire continent. This is a very happy uh, experience for us. And in, in later years, such situations uh, as the ones we are discussing have developed. The order in Europe has uh, places where it, it is damaged, where it's, well, it shows signs of coming apart, and we don't want that to happen. This is why uh, these regional situations are so important to us, beyond the humanitarian side, beyond the interests of the people and the countries involved. Um, and in fact, uh, Germans have played a certain role in, in the international efforts to address the conflicts in, in Georgia. Uh, and German diplomats specifically, speaking about my colleagues. Uh, one older diplomat, Dieter Boden, was the head of the UN mission in, in Georgia for a couple of years. And I will talk about his personal contribution in a minute. Um, after the war of 2008, another German, uh, hans jörg Haber, was the first head of the EU monitoring mission. Uh, and later, uh, Herbert Salber, a colleague I know well, uh, was uh, the EU special representative for uh, Georgia and the conflicts here between 2014 and 2017. And of course, in all of these missions of the UN, of the OSCE, of the EU, uh, Germans are working and they, they make a solid contribution to, to these uh, contingents. Germany also, Germany as a country was the co coordinator of the so-called uh, Friends of the UN Secretary General for Georgia. I see uh, some of you know this, this group and, and this name. Um, the group of Friends sounds very nice. Um, more realistically, this was uh, a place, a forum, where um, very hard diplomatic negotiations uh, took place uh, and a place which served to integrate Russia into these efforts at the United Nations in New York. Uh, the UN have dealt with the situation in Abkhazia, South Ossetia many, many times. There are piles of UN resolutions. Russia could not escape uh, the issue and uh, did take part in, in these discussions. And uh, Germany decided to play this role and be the coordinator of, of this group. Uh, as long as it existed after the war of 2008, unfortunately, this, this group became inoperative. It has not played a role anymore. Um, Precisely in this group around uh, the year 2000, there seemed to be an, an opening, there seemed to be a certain interest also of Russia to make a contribution and move forward in, in resolving the Akhaz situation. And the de facto authorities in, in Sukhumi were at this time ready to talk about federal solutions. And of course, federalism is another thing that rings a bell for, for Germans. We are great federalists, we are specialists in federal law, federal construction. And uh, believe me, the Russian Federation is a federation only in name. Uh, I don't want to say anything about other federations in the world, but uh, in, in Germany, this is a very important part of, of political practice. 
Um, so, uh, Dieter Boden took upon himself the task to, uh, to find a formula for uh, addressing the constitutional question. I said, okay, um, basically both sides want to resolve the conflict, right? Yes, okay, you find agreement on the two sides. And he said, okay, the, the only problem you have, don't talk about status, don't talk about independence, uh, so this is makes it only difficult talk about the distribution of competences. Now, this is something pragmatic, this we can discuss. And after, you have to imagine this as a very, very long, uh, torn out process over, over months and years. He received the mandate to draft a paper for, um, as he formulated it, basic principles for the distribution of competence of constitutional competences between Tbilisi and Sukhumi. And in the title alone you can see how uh, the diplomat who drafted this avoided all sorts of difficulties. Uh, it was not the distribution of competences between Georgia and Abkhazia or anything like that, between Tbilisi and Sukhumi, avoiding, uh, avoiding difficulties. Uh, the balancing act he had to do um, led to uh, a paper that actually received the approval of, uh, of both sides, of Tbilisi and Sahum, of the Georgian government and the de facto authorities, and a paper that was also endorsed at the United Nations Security Council. And this is not a small uh, achievement. If you can get agreement in the UN Security Council that Russia and China have to agree with the United States and so on, um, so, uh, in 2002, a major success for Mr. Boden and uh, German diplomacy, which had helped this, the paper was adopted. Uh, unfortunately, in, 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 the, in the time that followed, uh, nothing concrete happened. Of course, it was tried to put the paper into practice and to do what, what the paper contained, which was basically to say uh, that the both the two sides should uh, should negotiate um, a constitutional agreement. Was it that was that the term? Federal agreement should conclude a federal agreement. So for an, an asymmetric federation, not many entities forming one federation, but one entity. Let me quote. Let me quote from the paper because this is too precious to put it into my words. Georgia was referred to in the paper as a sovereign state and Abkhazia as a sovereign entity within the state of Georgia. Um, if you ask any uh, diplomat or international lawyer, he will tell you this is nonsense. Who drafted this? Uh, you are sovereign or not? And if you're a sovereign state, you have no other sovereign states inside you. It would be like saying, I'm, I'm a person, but I have a couple of persons inside me. Yeah? <laughs> but I'm one, don't worry. Yeah? Uh, this would sound sort of strange. So, uh, was, it, was it nonsense? No, not at all. Uh, Dieter Boden came from the tradition of German Ostpolitik. In the 70s, Germany concluded agreements that contained incredible compromises between recognition and non-recognition went very far, in dangerously far, people thought at the time, in recognizing the German Democratic Republic as a state without giving up the idea of national unity. And he tried to bring such principles to, to this uh, situation here in, in Georgia in the thinking Let's make a compromise in some paper on a high level. The important thing is to achieve progress on the ground. If the two sides can agree on how to work and how to work together, that is good. And we can deal with status issues, legal issues, at a much later stage. Uh, it seems, however, that this approach taken from German Ostpolitik uh, did not entirely fly here in Georgia. It did not come into, into practice, and the both, both sides were not sufficiently comfortable with it. 
at the time, you have to imagine Russia took a very different position from the one it had today. So actually, the international community um, puts a certain amount of pressure on the both on both sides, on Tbilisi and Sukhumi, and they agreed a little bit against uh, their will. No, uh, neither Tbilisi nor Sukhumi wanted to appear as the side which was not ready to conclude such an agreement. Uh, fast forward a couple of years and we come to a, to a different situation, another German effort at uh, addressing uh, specifically the Abkhaz situation. This was in 2008 already, but 2008 before the war of August. Um, it was a situation um, when uh, Western states had recognized the independence of Kosovo, when Georgia had made progress towards NATO membership at the Bucharest summit, uh, and it was very clear that Russia was not happy. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were unambiguous about that, and uh, they showed very clearly where uh, they would like to, to strike back. Um, for instance, there was a decree by President Putin to establish, oh, uh, yeah, still Putin, it was still Putin. Uh, to establish, uh, because the election came later and Medvedev took office in, in summer, but it, I think it was in April, Putin decreed uh, official relations with Abkhazia. April 16th. Hmm? April 16th, thank you. I, I knew that the experts and the audience here are not in front. Um, so it was very clear that, that this was a, a direction. Um, and um, Western and German diplomacy tried to avoid a situation, an outbreak of, of a crisis in, uh, in Abkhazia. Nobody thought it would come in South Ossetia, or at least that is what I gather from, uh, from the papers I could, I could find. So uh, Georgia was also unhappy with the situation in Abkhazia because at that time you had a peacekeeping force there, which was officially a community of independent states, but de facto it was a Russian um, contingent, and Georgia didn't uh, consider Russia as impartial peacekeepers, uh, and wanted to end the agreement that had allowed uh, this uh, CIS force in, in Abkhazia. Um, Foreign Minister Steinmeier, our federal president today, then he was Foreign Minister, uh, consider this as, as a dangerous uh, possibility. Uh, it was clear that the Russian troops would not withdraw even if they lost their status as peacekeepers. And so you would create occupation by taking away the legal, uh, the legal foundation for, for their presence. Uh, and Steinmeier took, uh, made a great effort uh, to draft a plan that uh, would avoid such a situation and uh, show the parties that uh, the conflict could be resolved. This was a bit different from, from the Bowdoin plan. Let's, let's look at this. Uh, it was a three-step plan, and actually the plan, <coughs> I have a certain difficulty here, the plan uh, was never uh, publicized. Uh, it never saw public light, but the media were briefed on, on the outlines of the plan. So I can, I can follow that, that line, and we are not so interested in the details anymore, right? Uh, the first phase would be a phase of confidence building, where both sides would exchange declarations of non-use of force. That was also an element which played a certain role in, in Ostpolitik uh, many years earlier. Um, they would also agree to the, as they said, continuation of the return of IDPs. Some internally displaced persons had already returned, for instance, to the Gali region. So you could speak of return, of, uh, of continuation of return of IDPs. Uh, this was intended to, um, to create a more, a more uh, to, to defuse some of the tension. And about the peacekeepers, they should stay where they were, but their mandate should be changed uh, into a mandate to work more for peace building. Uh, so not only uh, police and security functions, but the peace building, working with the two communities to address the communal conflict. The second phase, and this is perhaps typical for German diplomacy, would be a phase of 
reconstruction, starting with a big donors, donors conference in Berlin, as we offered. A foreign minister, you must know, has no money available. He has to go to the Minister of Finance. So if I go to an international negotiation and I know I need the incentive of big money to bring the parties to the table, um, I can't say that as a foreign minister. But what you can do, you can say, oh, we are ready to host a donors conference in Berlin. And this is enough of a signal usually so that people understand. It was later done in Afghanistan also. Okay, they have a donors conference in Berlin. German money will be available. And then you have to put the Minister of Finance in, into a squeeze and, and get the money out of him. Um, at the third phase of, of this three-step three plan, uh, very far away beyond the phase of reconstruction was the phase where um, issues of status were to be addressed. So, uh, unlike the border plan, which somehow tried to find a solution for the status issues, even not talking about status, the Steinmeier plan put status really off into the future and really uh, was addressed at, at uh, resolving the, the present and um, very urgent situation. You see that these uh, specific peace plans and specific German contributions were all made before 2008. Uh, after the war of 2008, uh, the room for such diplomatic initiatives has become much smaller. It is, it is not so easy to do anything uh, of the kind. Still, uh, Germany feels interested and feels involved, and we want to be part in, in addressing this uh, situation. Uh, we strongly feel that force does not create legitimacy, and that even the passing of time, even a lot of time, does not <coughs> turn an unjust situation into a legitimate one, into a rightful one. Addressing and transforming the conflicts will uh, require a movement on all three levels, the international geopolitical level, the bilateral level between Georgia and Russia, and the communal level. The most important forum uh, still, and as for many years, are the Geneva international discussions, where led by the EU, led by the EU special representative for Georgia, uh, at present this is the Estonian diplomat Toivo Klar, Maybe you've even had him here, you, you could invite him for such a discussion. Um, and uh, this is where uh, repeatedly, a couple of times each year, efforts are made to, to move issues forward a little bit. It requires a lot of uh, mental stability to go to such, uh, to such meetings and a lot of resistance to, to frustration. Georgia, I think, takes uh, the right approach in nearly all respects, I would say, in all respects, by uh, insisting on non-recognition of uh, Asia and South Ossetia, uh, by conducting pragmatic relations uh, with Russia, a lot of economic exchange with tourism. These are things discussed between Mr. Rashidze and Mr. Karsin in this famous uh, their talks. Um, and Georgia also does it right by engaging with the population in the non-government controlled uh, territories, by offering the plan a step towards a better future. It is a plan that I hope will come to fruition, will be, will be uh, turned into legislation and, and duly executed, uh, and open up more possibilities with engaging, for engaging with uh, the population. There, we hope to also play a role as Germany. Um, we are ready, for instance, to, to uh, offer scholarships for people from these regions. Uh, we think it would be good for, for some, especially young people, to be able to travel abroad, see the world from a different angle, and we hope that, that this would be a contribution to creating a certain, a certain dynamic uh, in Abkhazia and South Asia. This is something uh, that again comes from our experience of, uh, of the German Ostpolitik, which we see as the policy that uh, sooner than anybody expected led to political changes in Eastern Germany, 
contributed to changes in Eastern Europe and brought about the fall of the Berlin Wall 30 years ago. These are my, my thoughts on, on German policy vis-à-vis -vis, uh, the Georgian conflicts and I'm really looking forward to, uh, to a discussion with you and to hear from you. Thank you very much.